What's up, everybody? This is Neil Real, and this is Let's Please God, a ministry that helps you stay right with God and find victory over sin and the devil in the power of Christ Jesus. So today we are talking about agape love once again. This is part two of restoring agape love to your marriage. And last time I talked about seven of the 14 attributes that are found in 1 Corinthians 13 in regards to what godly love or what agape love really is. So I'm going to continue in talking about those seven other attributes and discuss what love looks like and what love doesn't look like, you know, and that's the reason for this. These talks here just to show you this is what love really looks like. Agape love, the God, the godly love you're supposed to have in your marriage. This is the way it's supposed to be. And as I said before, agape love is not about emotions and how you feel about a person It's simply about how you treat them according to the standards of God. And these same standards are what are in play in the kingdom of God. And when you come amongst the saints, these same standards of love should be there. And so these attributes that I'm talking about can be applied to your friendships, to your family members, to anybody in your circle you say you love or who you say is a friend or a family member or somebody that's close. These are the attributes that must be in place in order for you to have a successful relationship. All right. Without this, they don't love you and you don't love them. As simple as that. And so you can gauge a person, whether or not they're a child of God, by simply seeing if they have the fruit of the spirit, which is one, which is love. And looking at these 14 attributes and seeing whether or not they love you or not. You can just, you can just go by this. So today we're going to go over seven more and continuing on the next one, the number eight on the list of attributes of agape love is love is not easily provoked. That means it's not easily irritated and angered. Someone who easily, who is easily angered doesn't have the love of God. God gives us power over our emotions. Once you have this Holy Spirit and, he's, and you're walking in the Holy Spirit, you have power over your emotions. So your anger doesn't just overflow so quickly. You just don't get all crazy and angry so quickly. I've heard people tell me, so yeah, I get angry very quickly. I get, well, you don't have the love of God. Simple as that. If somebody can take you from a zero to a hundred in a few seconds by saying something to you, you don't have the love of God. In you, but simple as that. And so that's something you need to get born again, or you need to walk in the spirit. One of the two. Proverbs 21, 19 says, it is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. And so when we're talking about marriage, we, nobody wants to be around angry people. OK. They're contentious, they're angry. And the thing is, is they may not be angry with you. Let's say the wife is not angry with the husband, but if she's angry at something else and she's just always angry and, and she's, you know, easily provoked. If something happens and she just she just gets angry, she, this is not good for the marriage. OK. Another passage here. James 1, 19 and 20 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. We got to be slow. You know, God is slow to anger. So once again, these attributes that he's telling us to have, he's the same way. Did he destroy the whole earth just because, you know, of what somebody? No, he takes his time. It's, it's a long time before God actually does something to somebody they almost think you almost think to yourself god is not caring about what the evil that people are doing but no he's slow to anger he's slow to wrath he's giving them time to repent so it's not it's not a sin to be angry and that's what i want to be clear about this it just says not easily provoked love is not easily provoked love doesn't easily jump into anger and, and irritation and just immediately it's not easily done like that you know so here's another passage here Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says, be ye angry and sin not. So you said you can be angry, but don't sin. Let not the sun go down on your wrath, neither give place to the devil. All right. So we have a few passages here we can put together right now. First, don't be easily provoked. So love doesn't easily, we're not easily provoked to wrath. Okay. Um, we're not easily angered or irritated. All right. And if we are at some point, if we do get angry, we, we have not sinned. 
but we have to be sure not to sin. Don't let that anger lead us to do something because this is an emotion and that can lead us to do something that is, you know, that's, that's unseemly as we talked about last time. So it says here, be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down in your wrath. So another thing we need to do when it comes to anger, because we will get angry, our spouses will make us angry eventually. If we're slow to anger, we pass the test. And then this next thing here, if we do get angry, we don't sin. And the third thing here is don't let the sun go down in your wrath. So in other words, if you got a problem with your spouse, they did something, talk to them that day. Don't let the sun go down on the, on the issue. And say, hey, let me talk to you about this. This is what you did. This was offensive to me or, you know, whatever it was that, that made you angry, talk about it before the sun don't let it fester and boil because it says here don't give place to the devil so what the devil does is if you don't talk about it with your spouse then um the enemy can talk more to you and, and make you boil, boil over over time you just you keep build, building up stuff and then and then you start to think a certain way about your your spouse that may not be true if you just discussed what the issue is with them but you keep you're not you putting it off you won't want to talk about it so and then eventually the enemy is in your in your in your marriage and now there's a divorce or there's there's uh with, with this next point i'm gonna bring out about thinking evil about how to harm your your spouse you know so we don't want to do that so don't let the, the 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 your your anger boil over don't be easily irritated and angered don't be easily provoked you know so be slow to wrath as the scriptures say slow to speak but swift to hear in other words, just listen to what's being said instead of jumping to conclusions or jumping to anger and then thinking about what you're going to do to that person or something like that. You know, and this can happen, like I said, inside the marriage or outside. So you can have an angry wife or angry husband who's angry with everybody all the time. And then he comes in with an angry attitude that's not helpful to the marriage. He may not be angry with his wife, but if he's angry all the time with everybody and he's hitting walls and he's yelling and screaming, this is not good for the marriage, especially when children got to see that all the time. However, we are called to be angry, you know, be angry about sin, be angry about injustice in the world. You know, these are things that we're going to be angry about, but we, we can't allow anger to lead us to sin is what the scriptures are saying. And we can't be easily provoked. So a personal offense can't lead us to do something out of pocket or unseemly. You see, so he's showing us this is what love is. OK, and the only way for us to be this way where we're we're um, slow to wrath and we don't let anger lead us to sin is that we have the Holy Spirit in us work, we working in us to keep us that way. That's the only way to be successful. As I said before, if you want to restore agape love back to your marriage. If you want to bring it into your marriage. You never had it. The way you do it is get born again and walk in the spirit. Okay, we need the power of God in order to live like God and to be like God. That's the only way it works. You cannot do this in your own flesh. All right. Number nine, love doesn't think on evil. So um, in the scriptures here, it says, um, think if no evil. So if you're at a place where you're plotting to harm your spouse for any reason, sabotage them or in some cases for a friendly, which is not friendly at all, prank them for laughs. And I've seen this happen when people do this online, they'll prank their, their spouse, something that cause a, a negative emotion in them all for laughs. That's thinking on evil, that's wrong. I know you didn't mean to really do it, but you did it, that's, that's evil. God doesn't play games with people like that. He doesn't do that. So if you're at a place where you're plotting evil against your spouse, then you know you're in the wrong place already. He said, love doesn't think on evil. Don't think evil. It's not thinking of evil against your spouse. So sometimes this happens where one spouse wants to get back at the other spouse for correcting. This is usually with the woman, if the man is, is leaving and the woman is not always submissive or whatever, and she doesn't like correction. In some cases, the woman will plot some evil against her husband for correcting her. In other words, I'm going to punish you for correcting me. That's thinking on evil and, and plotting. And God says, even in that instance, you're wrong. Even if you didn't get to do it, you still in sin. That's not love. OK, so love doesn't think on evil. Seeking revenge and harm to other people. This isn't love. So say, for instance, you're, you know, some a lot of husbands are there at a place right now where their their wives have divorced them or their wives are 
doing things against him, they're in a place in their mind where they're thinking about murder. They're thinking about harming their, their spouse, their wives. These, when you had a place like this, this is not, this is not right. You don't love them. You had a place where that's what you want to do to them. You don't love them. Okay. And we all kind of understand that, but this has to be written out. This wise in scripture to show us what love doesn't look like. And it doesn't look like a person having these deep evil thoughts against their spouse. It doesn't work. And, and this is also connected to unforgiveness. So say for instance, something was done to you, but you never forgave. You still may have these, these areas of resentment that lead to you thinking on evil against your spouse. And so we can't do that. So we have to go back to the first the, the attribute before this, which is don't be easily provoked and don't let this, the sun set on your anger. So talk to your spouse about what offends you, what bothers you and get that out in the open and get that resolved. And they're both, you're both two people who love the Lord and want to get you, it, it'll be resolved, you know? So love doesn't think on evil. Continuing on number 10, love rejoices in the truth, not in iniquity. So love does not rejoice in iniquity. What is iniquity? Iniquity is injustice. It's violating the law of justice. Um, it's an act of unrighteousness. I iniquity is sin. It's, it's breaking the law. It's injustice. And so we don't rejoice in wickedness. We don't do that. That's, love doesn't do that. We don't re rejoice in that. But he goes on to say that love rejoices in the truth. We take joy in the truth. In other words, we are honest people. You know, being honest with your spouse. Uh, don't be lying to your spouse. And there's a bunch of ways you can lie to your spouse. But the bottom line is, if you love your spouse, you rejoice in the truth. You tell them the truth. You're honest. And you owe them that being that that's your spouse. Okay. If you find that you, you're not doing that, then it's an indication that you don't love them. Right. And so once again, God gives us the power to, to actually live these attributes. Okay. You know, we lie for a bunch of reasons. We lie because we, we've sinned and we want to hide our faults. We lie because we are pretending to be something that we're not. We lie because we fear the disapproval or rebuke of other people, you know, but the solutions are always to be open and honest and to focus on pleasing God rather than people. Um, stop pretending to be something that we're not and just repent of our sins. You know, don't do things that you got to hide. You know, if you got to hide that, then just stop doing it. But, you know, these are things that saints do. Sinners, well, they don't, they're going to lie. They're going to do all this kind of stuff. They're going to they bask in, in iniquity. They, this is what they do. So it's an indication whether you're a child of God or not, if uh, you are rejoicing in the truth or if you are rejoicing in iniquity. Number 11 here, uh, love bear for all things. Now, these words here, when you break that down, it means that it covers something. So you have a spouse and they tell you something private. You don't go around spreading all they got their, their, their stuff out there. OK, if you have a friend. You don't do that. So love doesn't gossip. Love bears the private details of the marriage. So to expose your spouse's personal business is like exposing yourself. You know, a lot of people don't think of it that way because they, they, they don't even see themselves as a part of their spouse, as, as one unit. But that's exactly what you're doing. And I've seen this happen where guys will talk about their wives to other men. And now when you see the wife, you think in your mind what the man said about her. She, had met, she might have changed. She may have become a bit better person, a different person or whatever. But because that man was talking all that stuff about his wife, exposing all her dirt or whatever, people tend to look at your spouse the way you said, you know, how, how you presented them, even if they changed, even if they, you know, so it's not a good thing. Women do the same thing. They go and gossip in with their the girls, spreading stuff about their husband, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same thing is going to happen. They're going to see that your spouse is a certain way. And, and what that does is make you look bad as well, because that's your spouse. You chose them. And here you are saying all this negative stuff about them. And even if they change, like I said, the people may still see them in a certain light. You know, so it's important to keep your business private. You know, you don't tell everybody. It's not love that just expose your partners or your spouse's stuff. That's love. Nobody likes when you have a conversation with somebody privately and then that in, that information ends up being public or somebody else find out about it. You know, it's not lack of love. It's betrayal in some cases. It's it's wrong, you know, and so love bears all things. It, it, it does not gossip. It covers. It protects private details of the marriage. And we don't put that out there. 
Never bad mouth your wife. Never bad mouth your husband. So love bears all things. All right. Another one here, number 12, love believes all things. Another translation is, you know, love trust. So you treat your, your spouse with trust. In order to love, you must trust and you must be vulnerable. That's part of loving somebody. You have to trust. You ever been around a person that never really trusts you to always treat you like you're going to take something from them, steal them. That's not love. And it makes the other person feel like, man, I mean, like a criminal, like somebody, you know, and if you if you've been black in the United States, you know how this feels. You go to stores, they act like they, you know, you're going to steal something all the time. They're always treating you some kind of way. So it's not a good feeling. And you got to put yourself in your spouse's shoes. However, there are certain maturity levels that you know about, about your spouse that certain things they can't handle or they've shown to fail in certain areas that you can't trust them with that. You can't give them that. But overall, as a person, you ought to be trusting them. That's your spouse. Now, as I continue on in this series, there are spouses that are born again. There are people who mean to do you harm. There are certain areas you can't trust them. And that's just the way it is. It's for protection of yourself. You can't trust them in certain areas. But overall, what God is saying here is love, trust. It's you, there must be trust in, if you're going to have this person in your life. There must be trust. Okay. And this is especially when, let's say, there is an offense in the marriage where one spouse has repented, the door should be opened back up. Okay. They shouldn't be treated like they're always this, this offender because it's not going to help them grow. And it's definitely not going to, um, it makes you, your life as a person who don't trust them more stressful because you're always thinking about what they're going to do and all this stuff. You need to release that and, and trust that person. They confess their sins and repent it and change their ways. Let them back in and trust them. Okay. And this applies to the church and everybody else that's in your circle that you say you love and, that, and, that, and who says they love you. It's the same thing. Another attribute of love, number 13 here is love, hope of all things. I have a whole article about this. The word hope here means to hope for the best, meaning that um, we don't think on negative outcomes for your spouse's life. You're always thinking positive. This is going to be, we hope for the best. This is, we hope that this is going to happen. We don't like, I've heard people um, in, in relationships, not necessarily uh, spouses, but in so-called friendship where one spouse or one person rather is just always negative about the other person's come up. You know, you ain't going to make it. You ain't going to do this. You ain't going to do that. That's not hoping for the best. You got to hope for the best. Speak positive on what they're going to do. They're going to they going for a job interview. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. Speak positive on that. Be positive and say, look, this is this is good. This is going to happen. That's going to be positive about it. OK, don't be a person that's hoping bad things happen to your spouse. Always speaking negative. That's not good. That's the thing about God. He speaks positive over. He said, this is what's going to happen. We hope this for you and all that kind of stuff. However, then if they have a history of failing in certain areas or whatever, saying that they are, they're doing that is not necessarily not hoping for the best, but at the same time, we have to be still positive. Always try to project positivity on the person, but, um, love, hope of all things or hopes for the best. Okay. It's not helpful to somebody saying you, you gonna fail. You gonna, you ain't this, you ain't that. Like that's not helpful to nobody. You know, we, we talked about words, I think in a few articles, long time ago on my site and you know we got to speak positivity you know especially people in our circle that we we claim to love okay the fourth the 14th and the final attribute as far as in this these verses and these passages here on love is love endures all things or it endures to the end it doesn't give up it's loyal to the marriage it doesn't just break off and like people are doing today you know they they married for two years and they and they they, they run into a snag and they and they divorce Okay. They didn't have no loyalty. They didn't have no endurance. They didn't have love. Love was not present in the marriage. That's why they broke up so quickly. Okay. You know, so two years in, you was want to just give up. Like, no, that's not how it works. Okay. So if you got love there, y'all going to stay together and y'all going to work it out. You're going to endure to the end, especially if both of you have it. There's something called pergamy right now is where, and this is feminism and, um, gynocentrism is teaching women to do this now is basically if you get married to a man get what you can from him if you see another man that has more than him maybe more good looks or he has more money or more higher status dump that your husband get another get that man if you can that's basically what women are being told to do and, and and they said this is just it's just about you you know men are nothing but resources so 
if you gotta if you deal with a poor guy, deal with him for now, and then when you get when you get higher status, or if you can get to another man that's got more money, dump him, get to get another one, and just keep going high as possible you can. That's um, what they call hypergamy, and but that's disloyalty. What it is, it's a lack of endurance in the marriage. If there's snags, the the, the vow said for better or for worse, rich or poor, sickness and health. And so what's happening is there's a lack of loyalty going on here. And one of the attributes of love is loyalty. If you said you're gonna be with the person, stay with them. Don't abandon them because they don't make the amount of money that you want them to make. And in most cases, these guys are providing. It may not be the highest, you know, they might be, might not be living on a yacht or be having a mansion, all that kind of stuff, but they got the necessities and they're living comfortably. And for the woman to do that is a, is a lack of loyalty. I've seen the same thing with men as well. You know, at some point they just, they leave a, a woman for a white woman, you know, and nothing wrong with their wife, you know, in some cases it's just, oh, I want this other woman. And because they live in a monogamous society, but they only have one woman, they dump the woman they've been with them for years. And when they reach a certain financial status, it's just terrible because they didn't do anything to deserve that. So it was wrong for that. And that's a lack of loyalty to the marriage. So it goes both ways in marriages. And when you say you're going to marry somebody, you stay with them. That's, that's it. Okay. Of course, there are times when you have to divorce. Uh, we'll talk about that. You, you do have to separate. We'll talk about that. But love endures to the end. Okay, if you say you're going to get married, stay, stay together, bottom line. Okay, you made an oath and commitment to God. Okay, it's not just to your spouse, but to God. A lot of people are acting like this is just between them and we can break it up anytime. No, you went into the marriage covenant, which God created. That's his thing you entered into. So you're going to have to stay in it. Well, I didn't know what it was all about. Well, well, who cares? If you di driving down an expressway and you are speeding, just because you, you didn't see the sign doesn't mean you don't get the ticket. You're still accountable to the laws. And, and most people, they read the same vows. They got the same as the better or worse, sickness to death to death to you part. Okay, y'all read that. So even if you didn't know that, that was connected to the Bible, which it is, if y'all didn't know that, you had the preacher read it to you. So you know that's what y'all, you spoke, so stay to the end, you know, work it out. But I know because we live in a gynocentric society where the, uh, the woman has been told one thing and the man has been told another thing that is it's hell going on in marriages today okay and god has not called us to be in a place that's not peaceful so i will be talking about why you should divorce why you should uh let the other spouse go or whatever and what to do about that but love endures to the end if you say you're going to be married to death to your part fulfill that work it out and if both of you are born again and you both love the lord you you're willing to work and walk in the spirit You'll be successful. It's simple as that. You know, you can overcome anything because God is in your marriage. All right. So go over this list again. Are you enduring to the end? Do you feel like giving up? Do you want to give up? Are you hoping for the best for your spouse? Hoping for the best. Are you trusting your spouse? Like I said, there's a limit to that depending on their behavior, especially if you're married to an unbeliever. You can't trust them with everything because they might be trying to set you up or something crazy or something like that. So. But the point here is trust should be there in the marriage, especially if somebody has been repented of sin. Love bears all things or love doesn't gossip or doesn't spread your spouse's stuff. So are you being private about your spouse's behavior and things, and things of that nature? Love is rejoicing in the truth. It's honest. Are you honest with your spouse? Be honest with your spouse. OK, ask yourself these questions if you're doing these things. Love doesn't think evil. Of course, if you're at a place where you want to hurt your spouse or you want to see something evil happen to him, if you're plotting something against him, and, I, and like I mentioned, pranking your wife is wrong, okay? I've seen too many um, people post stuff like that on Facebook, and they're laughing like, I'm like, this ain't funny. This woman was scared out of her mind until she realized it was a joke. Like, the, you don't do that. You don't go and get um, do things to, to your spouse to get them to, to feel some kind of way, only for, for a laugh. That's disrespectful. It's, it's harmful. It's, just, it's wrong. I don't care if it didn't really happen, you know, but that's that's thinking on evil. Let's figure out a way to create dark, deep emotions in my, my wife or my husband all for a laugh. OK, that's a lack of love. All right. Number eight, which is the, um, the first one we talked about today. Love is not easily provoked. So we talked about not being easily irritated or angered. Think of, think of yourself, you know, is this happening to you? Being slow to anger, letting, letting the sun set on your anger. In other words, talking about issues you have with your spouse, 
before you go to sleep at night. You don't want that to fester and boil up. So ask yourself these questions. Look through these verses and see whether or not you're doing them. And if you're not, ask God for his Holy Spirit to empower you to do it. OK, you must be born again in order to have love, the love of God, the agape love of God. And you must be walking in the spirit in order to to actually fulfill it. And you need power from the Holy Spirit. This is not something we do on our own. It's something that is only accomplished through the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot do it in our own flesh. There are people faking it all the time. There are people who are trying their best in their own flesh, but they're going to fail eventually and they're going to fall hard. OK, so that's unacceptable. God doesn't want you to do it that way. He would rather you yield to his Holy Spirit and say, I need your power. And through that, that power that comes from the Holy Spirit, you're able to to love consistently and it just becomes something a part of you. You know, you just you just think of a different way from the rest of the world. The way you operate is just the way God operates because you're a child of God. I encourage you to look at these these verses in First Corinthians 13, chapter 13, and just really examine them and see whether or not your life is lining up with that. And if not, it's OK if we all fall short. Repent of your sins, ask God to clean you, and then ask for the Holy Spirit's power to keep you so that you can love like Christ loves and, and love your spouse. So that's how you restore, once again, agape love back to your marriage by walking in the Spirit. But until next time, walk in the Spirit and be blessed.